As Israel's siege of Gaza continues, a battle is playing out in the realm of public opinion. While demonstrations have taken place across the globe in solidarity with Palestinians, there have also been campaigns to silence critics of Israel's actions. Commentators, academics, and even common citizens have reported an increase in threats and retaliation for expressing their views or voicing solidarity with the Palestinian people, often in countries that proclaim to uphold values of freedom of expression and democracy. So who decides what the limits of free speech are? And are there double standards when it comes to Palestine? Joining me to discuss this from Chicago is Dima Khaledi. She is founder and director of Palestine Legal. And from Haifa is Ilan Pape. He is author of numerous books on the issue of Israel and Palestine, including The Biggest Prison on Earth, A History of the Occupied Territories. He's also a professor of history at the University of Exeter. I want to thank you both uh, for joining me. Ilan, I'm going to start with you. Uh, at the moment, pro-Palestine protests are being suppressed in a number of countries across Europe, uh, Austria and Germany. They've blocked protests. Uh, in France, we've seen pro-Palestine demonstrations uh, only now being allowed on a case-by-case -case basis, when at first there was a total ban on them. Uh, how do these nations, how do they justify this kind of crackdown on free speech? I, I think that they justify it by accepting, and I hope not for too long, the Israeli narrative of totally dishistoricizing the event of the 7th of October, decontextualizing it, uh, namely uh, as if what happened on the 7th of October uh, totally absorbs Israel from all its criminal policies in the past and gives a free license for its criminal policies now uh, in the present. And as such, it is... Uh, immunized by this uh, kind of framing uh, any support for the Palestinians as a support for terror and so on. I, I'm, I'm quite confident that this would not uh, hold water for too long. We already see some of it being kind of the ch some of the scene changes. But uh, all in all, you know, double double talk about Palestine, hypocrisy about Palestine, a progressive people who are progressive on anything but on Palestine is not a new thing. In, in fact, the 7th of October hasn't changed anything fundamental in the way Israel is covered, perceived, or immunized uh, in the West. I, I like that, that word immunized is an interesting one, Dima, uh, and an important one, because even to Elon's point, if these large Western nation states have accepted the Israeli narrative and they've dehistoricized October 7th, that explains their political position but what it doesn't explain is why they're stopping people from having a different political position, why they, why they stop people from disagreeing. I mean, the point of free speech is not to be able to articulate your point of view when it goes along with the state narrative. The whole point of these protections, ostensibly, is to protect you when it doesn't. So how, do, how, how can these democratic nations justify this kind of behavior? It seems so clearly anti-democratic. It is anti-democratic, and I think it is signaling a, a really quick descent into fascism uh, that we're seeing around the globe. Um, in the United States, there are very strong First Amendment protections, uh, much stronger than in Europe. And, and yet, even here, we are seeing a crackdown on uh, dissent on Palestine. We're seeing across the board uh, not only government action to surveil and investigate uh, activists for Palestinian rights, but but also in the private sector, uh, a purging, uh, a very McCarthyist type of purging of uh, any support for Palestinian rights, even as people are mobilizing right now to stop what international experts have called a, an unfolding genocide. And, and this is so dangerous and uh, certainly hypocritical. Um, I, I think, you know, the United States and European nations have no more authority right now uh, as they are, uh, you know, shutting down this critical conversation and these critical protests that are uh, challenging what our governments are allowing to happen. Uh, Elon, we've seen a very real and concerning rise in anti-Semitism since October 7th, which, of course, should be addressed and taken very seriously. And yet the governments are responding with these types of bans. Uh, is this the West's attempt to make amends for centuries of anti-Semitism? Yes, Mark, it is. And, and I think that's what I meant, that uh, the 7th of October, as dramatic and tragic it is, it is, as it is, uh, does not change the fundamental 
issues that relate to the, the issue of Palestine. The whole Zionist project was in part uh, an attempt to deal with anti-Semitism in Europe at the expense of, uh, of uh, the Palestinians. It became even more urgent uh, project of, of guilt, if you want, after the Holocaust. And, and it was a very easy way, in fact, of not having a closure with the Holocaust in Europe itself or with racism in America, for instance, uh, by solving this issue, by giving this uh, license to colonize Palestine and build a Jewish state on the ruins of Palestine. This is something that uh, was there before the 7th of October. It just, you know, uh, it, it comes back to us in this particular issue of how it's being covered uh, today. Uh, and how anti-Semitism, again, is manipulated by Israel, or weaponized, rather, by Israel and its supporters in order to suppress and silence uh, criticism of the policy, even if the criticism is now directed against actual genocidal policies on the ground. A good example of what you're talking about, Elon, just happened. The Israeli ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, has called for the body's secretary general, Antonio Guterres's resignation, and even accused him of blood libel after he said that the Hamas attack was horrifying and unjustified, but, quote, did not occur in a vacuum. Israel has also said that it will ban UN representatives from visiting the country to, quote, teach them a lesson. Dima, were you surprised at this reaction? Well, it's what Ilan is saying, and, uh, it, you know, it is an attempt to completely dehistoricize what is going on. It is an attempt to immunize, to shield Israel from any criticism or accountability. Um, you know, the, Israel has been on a path to delegitimize the United Nations, to undermine uh, all institutions that try to uphold international law, um, because it is in fundamental and flagrant violation of international law. And the only way that it can uh, avoid that is, is by undermining the entire system. And this is the danger. Um, and, and the European and nations and the United States are following in that path of completely undermining any, uh, any protections that we have in the international community against these egregious violations of, of international law that were ironically put in place uh, post-World War II to prevent what happened in Europe and to, to Jews and other minorities from happening again. And it's also about, uh, again, erasing Palestinians and Palestinian history and experience from, from this conversation. Many people are experiencing very real troubles, legal troubles. They're, they're coming under attack, et cetera. I mean, your organization, Palestine Legal, uh, works uh, to protect the people's rights, at least here in the United States. What kind of cases are you seeing now uh, from people who have been offering critiques or protests of, of, of what's happening in Israel and Palestine? Mark, we've seen an exponential increase in requests for legal help in the last two weeks. Um, uh, almost as many as we saw in all of uh, last year. Um, so the attack is widespread and it's far reaching. A lot of what we're seeing are employment consequences for people who post something or speak out in their workplaces or uh, share their opinion on what's going on. And uh, a, a number of, of uh, dozens of incidents of people being fired or investigated by their employers. Uh, students in particular are being severely doxxed and harassed and even targeted by their own universities for uh, their advocacy and their activism and their protests right now. And this is not new. Uh, we have been documenting over the last decade that Palestine Legal has existed, a Palestine exception to free speech and these exact same tactics, but it is being escalated at an exponential rate. Ilan, you are a an eminent scholar, uh, and you're also known as one of the new historians, those Israeli scholars uh, who have questioned the official Israeli narrative of the state's creation, arguing that, uh, in your words, events were, quote, much closer to the Palestinian historical narrative than to the Zionist one. Uh, you've questioned the Zionist project, which many people believe is anti-Semitic as such. Uh, looking at those who now claim that expressing solidarity with Palestinians after October 7th 
is fundamentally anti-Jewish. I, I can't help but draw a little bit of a parallel here. Um, how are we still in a place where voicing any kind of support for Palestinians is deemed anti-Semitic, or any critique of Israel is anti-Semitic? Well, I, I think, Mark, it depends who we're talking about. I think in what one can define as a civil society, if I compare it to the 1980s, for instance, I think there is a dif deeper and more profound understanding of the difference between Judaism and Zionism, and therefore the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Uh, I think one of the challenges we have, those of us who are being attacked either, either as anti-Semites or, in my case, as a self-hating Jew, one, one of the, the problems we have is that we cannot answer these challenges with sound bites. Uh, we need we need we need space to explain because we are facing a project of propaganda and fabrication and immunization and also weaponization of anti-Semitism not that that began many many years ago and is supported by a state. So so we cannot challenge this with soundbite and I think that's why it takes time to make headway into the uh, public domain and to the political discourse. But we should insist on this. I, I guess the question for me, Dima, is how? You know, because I agree with everything Elon just said. There's no space for nuance. Uh, the public opinion is very uh, polarized at the moment. And a lot of it is because people are speaking in sound bites. There's no room to have a complicated conversation here. Uh, how do we close that gap? How do we have the nuance? Well, Mark, I think you know well this is a, a narrative battle as, as much as it is a, a political one. Um, we are talking about a settler colonial state that has uh, dispossessed a people of their homeland and that has tried to replace it with another population. And uh, th that is the fundamental re uh, truth that we have to go back to. Um, you know, when we're talking about a, a state's actions. Um, this is a state that describes itself itself as Jewish, that claims Jewish supremacy as a uh, as its its foundation, um, and that is what we have to be talking about. Uh, this is an exclusivist, uh, ethno-nationalist state that is uh, founded on the eradication, expulsion, ethnic cleansing of another people. And if we can't uh, uh, oppose and criticize this state, and if we are uh, allowing our elected officials to pass legislation um, that that defines anti-Semitism as uh, you know cr any criticism of Israel, which is what's happening right now across the uh, across the globe, and um, this uh, this debate and this nuance uh, can't happen. Elon, how do we close the gap? How do we uh, create space for historicizing this this struggle? I think that we we should insist of of having the conversation on our terms, uh, uh, instead of uh, sitting in in studios or wherever we are attacked, and uh, apologizing or defending ourselves by saying no, we are not anti-Semites, and we should just be patient and build our uh, campaign because it is built on truth. We have allies in in the global south. We have allies in the global north. We can build a campaign because it's so absurd and it's such a fabricated accusation allegation that it should not hold water, even if it still uh, enables uh, institutions to get rid of people and so on. Uh, this is a form of racism to 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 uh, you know to accuse you of being a racist by being an anti-Zionist or even criticizing Israel. It means that you are a victim of racism yourself. Uh, and that's the way it should be fought uh, to my mind. Ilan Pape, Dima Khalidi, thank you both so much for joining me on Upfront. That is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.